With the worldwide collapse of socialism in the late 80s and early 90s, the Marxist left did not just throw in the towel. Uh, I remember at the time I was at the University of Tennessee and there was a Marxist uh, economist on the faculty and I ran into him in the parking lot right in the middle of all this happening with uh, Boris Yeltsin bombing the Russian parliament and things like that. And, uh, and I said, uh, John, what are you going to do now? Bricklayer? Carpenter? You know, what's, what's, what's the future for you? And he said, oh, no, 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 we're, we're stronger than ever now because we're no longer associated with all these bad guys, Ceausescu and Stalin and all that. And so, and, and so after, after all this, um, there were, uh, the, the Marxist left took uh, two different routes. You know, they, they didn't give up. One is they, they, uh, they paid attention to the socialist economist Robert Heilbrunner, who wrote an article in the New Yorker magazine in 1990, I think it was October 1990, in which he said, uh, yeah, socialism, uh, Mises was right. I, the, one of the articles he wrote was actually called, the title was Mises was right about socialism. And so you would think that meant give up on socialism, but but no, he said we need we need to work harder at it, we, you know, because there, it, it always was about uh, totalitarian control. Uh, it's, it never was about uh, helping the poor, helping the laboring class, or anything like that. So it was always about control. And so how do we reassert our control over people's lives? He said, well, you know, socialism was always sold in the name of helping the people. And he, he essentially said, people schmeeple, the hell of the people. We're for the bugs and the ants and the snakes and, and all that stuff, the planet. So let's, let's sell socialism now in the name of saving the planet. And so, uh, and so hence, uh, the watermelons were born. The watermelons were green on the outside, red on the inside. And so there's a branch of the Marxist left that all became environmentalists all of a sudden. And they're promoting a basically centrally planned economies under socialism, under the guise of saving the planet. The other branch became cultural Marxists. They gave up on the old uh, class struggle between the working class and the, and the capitalist class, and they invented some new classes. There's the oppressor class and the oppressed class. The oppressors are white heterosexual males, and the oppressed class is everybody else, pretty much. You know, the, the whole victim thing. And so, so that's a good way to, to, to uh, eliminate dissent and, and, and exert totalitarian control over society. And so we have those two classes. Now, I've been a, a university economics professor since 1979. I, I finished my PhD when I was 24, and I've been at it uh, ever since. And all for about the first 30 years of my career, every August, the university administration, and I've taught at seven different universities, uh, and every university administration would send out a memo about uh, what the average SAT score is of the incoming freshman. And they would usually brag that it's up 10 points or something like that. And it would usually be accompanied by a promise that we're gonna increase the standards uh, even more so that we'll have better qualified students. And of course, the faculty like this, to hear this. And that went on for about 30 years of my career, you know, year in, year out, uh, bragging about uh, how, you know, the higher SAT scores. And then about uh, six years ago, at my current employer, Loyola University, Maryland, they all of a sudden said, we're no longer requiring SAT scores at all as the entrance requirement. We did away with them. And, uh, and the result of that, uh, I, I noticed uh, uh, it's been successful because in, in the website, in the university website this year, in, in August, instead of, instead of giving us any information about the academic qualifications of the incoming freshman class, it said, the incoming freshman class is the, the most diverse class in the history of the college. And so, so that's the objective. And so, so egalitarianism has become the new uh, secular religion in the, the academic seminaries where you send your children and grandchildren. And diversity, I think of the word diversity is, is basically some sort of quotas, is, is really, I call it the mating call of the academic administrators in, in today's world. Uh, when when the, the cultural Marxists took over my university about 10 years ago, the new president came in and he started giving, the president's message started saying things like, 
of bemoaning the unequal distribution of resources around the world all of a sudden. And so, you know, from, from each according to his ability to each according to his need is his motto. His name is Brian Lenane. And, so, and his, uh, his academic vice president, who's the top academic officer of the university, when he had his first meeting with the business school faculty where, where I teach, he looked around the room and he said, there are too many people in here who look like me. Too many white guys, in other words. And the minority faculty were extremely uncomfortable about that. I was looking at my, my, my minority colleagues and they, well, they were like, didn't know where to hide. Because what, what he was basically saying was he was telling people like me, you don't really belong here because you're here because of white privilege. And also he was telling the minority faculty, well, maybe you don't belong here either because you're here from affirmative action. You know, you don't really belong there, you know? And so, and so that, I think that's why, one of the reasons why they seem so, so uncomfortable. And so, and then he denounced, he announced that diversity would be his number one goal in his, you know, in his, his reign as academic vice, vice president. So that's become the sort of the number one objective of, of a lot of universities. Uh, you know, more than academics, learning, education, education, schmeducation is, is the attitude some of these people seem to have <clears throat> when they when they do that. That's why, I, and I, I did call it the mating call of academic administrators in an article on BlueRockwell.com referring to this guy. This is Tim Snyder is his name, Timothy Snyder. And he's no longer the academic vice president of my university. He's, you know, he, he's done his thing. And so, so, and so silencing dissent is, is now praised and taught. It's taught to students and it's praised as the morally right thing to do. Uh, a lot of my students uh, are totally unaware of the case, the argument for free speech and academic freedom. And, and one of the, uh, one person who's responsible for this, and, and this, you know, this starts, really starts, I think, in, in the 60s, as, as a lot of bad things uh, st started in the 60s. And uh, there's an academic who's described on the, on the web uh, variously as the evangelist of cultural Marxism. He's also called a celebrated intellectual who taught at Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. His name is Herbert Marcuse, M-A-R-C-U-S-E. Uh, and he was, he's, he's really is sort of one of the gurus of political correctness among the, uh, the academic elite uh, that run today's, uh, most of today's universities in the United States. And uh, how did he become a celebrated intellectual? Well, uh, he wrote a 1955 book called Eros and Civilization, in which he advised young people the following, and I quote, don't work, have sex. And I guess it never occurred to him that the two things are not mutually exclusive uh, at all. But, but so, so it's, like, it's idiocy like this that makes you a celebrated intellectual at Harvard, I, I guess. And uh, he, he also denounced the scientific method in science. He said science and the scientific method are the enemy. He called it, quote, the enemy because, quote, it denies the reality of utopia. And by utopia, he meant communism. He was a communist. He was a, a, a self-described communist, and so yeah, it denies the re, uh, the reality of, of communism. Well, it sure does, uh, especially economic science. You know, Mises' great book Socialism explained that a, a long, long time ago. Uh, socialism could never work as an economic system. Okay, he opposed freedom of speech and academic freedom for the same reason that it produced too many criticisms of communism. You know, and so let's just shut everybody up about this and, and only give our students positive images of it. And it reminds me, at my university, I created a new course called Capitalism and Its Critics. It was my way of sneaking Austrian economics into the curriculum. And, and, uh, and it's been around, I've had it for about 10 years now, this, uh, uh, this, this course. And uh, I use one, you know, sometimes I've used the Communist Manifesto. You know, I, 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 give, I teach the students, here's what the bad guys have said, and then here's what Mises says about this or anything. So I go back and forth, here's what the environmental lunatics say, and here's, here's George Reisman over here, or something like that. And, uh, and so when I use the Communist Manifesto, I had a student tell me, you know, please, this is the fifth time I've been assigned the Communist Manifesto at this university. But, but all, all his other professors in philosophy and history 
use it as sort of a road map to the future. You know, they, I use it as a, a historical artifact. And, uh, but, but the other, the other people said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had a society like this? This student told me what his philosophy professor said. And so, so too many criticisms. He also said this, there's no need for logic, debate, and free exchange of ideas for Marxism provides the answers.